All right, I'm going to pray for us and ask the Lord's blessing on our evening tonight before we begin. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for your blessing upon this study of church history. It is such an important thing as we see the precedents that have been set, the way that you have worked in the past, the way that people have listened to you and not listened to your word in the past, and the terrible things that happen when we stray away from your word and that we do not listen to what you have said and we do not consider your scripture to be sufficient and instead we add to it and add to it and add to it and all the uh, the terrible things that come from that. So I pray your blessing upon this evening that it might stand as a great warning to us as to how far away we can stray if we neglect your word. I pray your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, chapter 22. So as we look at chapter 22 tonight, I would also like to have you think about, think back to the past. Uh, months ago when we began the study together, <clears throat> excuse me, and contrast what you're going to hear today and what you've heard in the past few weeks with the early church with what we read in the book of Acts and the, the joy of the early church devoting itself to the study of Scripture and to the works of Christ and to charitable works and to prayer, uh, to uh, honoring the Lord in all their ways, the selling of their possessions, to give to others to make sure that every need was met, all these types of things, and how far down uh, the church has gone and encrusting the commands of men onto the Word of God and um, what a terrible place it brings the church to. And the question that we'll answer, try to answer at the end of this is, what happened? Like, what has been lost to take us to this low point? But in chapter 22, uh, papal authority has, gone, has been pressed way too far. So the a title was extended and extended and extended until people didn't listen to the title anymore because it was too great and too grandiose and nobody wanted to hear it anymore. And so when nobody cared anymore, they had to use physical force. So they began to use wars through the Crusades, and then the Pope even authorized torture and physical death in order to force people to follow their ways as they were able to do that through the Crusades and the Inquisitions. But the kings of the latter Middle Ages began to wake up to the reality that this was all talk from the Pope, and the Pope was not able to back up what they had said. And if they were not afraid of their false accusations of excommunication and various other ways of weaponizing Christianity and their version of it in order to harm the societies that they were supposed to be serving, then they could fight back against this, and that's what you're going to see in this chapter. So in uh, the 1300s, the 14th century, King Edward I of England and Philip the Fair of France were trying to figure out how to finance a war between each other. And they figured out that, well, they knew that there was a huge amount of wealth bound up in the Roman Catholic Church because they used the church as their reason why they shouldn't be taxed but yet they lived lavish lifestyles, had incredibly large land holdings, and they lived like kings themselves. And so both of these kings, independently, Edward I and Philip the Fair, decided that they were going to start taxing the clergy. And we might, in our day and age, say, oh, that was terrible. How, how could they do that? How should they do that? But you need to think about it in a totally different way than, than the way the church functions in America. If very wealthy people were allowed to become pastors and buy a, a pastorship or buy a, a bishop position and then shelter all their wealth under that as a part of the church when they had nothing to do with the church. It was just wealthy people putting on airs in order to get a gigantic tax break. That's what we had going on. But that was something that the Pope desperately wanted to protect because that wealth flowed to him instead of flowing to the monarchs of the country that they lived in. So this is what happened. So let's read a little bit from page 217 as uh, Edward and Philip begin to tax. So in 1296, Boniface VIII had issued the Clericus Lycos, a document threatening excommunication for any ruler who taxed the clergy and any clergyman who paid those taxes without papal consent. 
But Edward and Philip were a new breed of secular monarch. Unimpressed by the threats from Rome, Edward's retort was to decree that if the clergy did not pay, they would be stripped of all legal protection and their extensive properties would be seized by the king's sheriffs. And Philip's answer was to place a complete embargo on the export of gold, silver, and jewels from his domains, thus depriving the papal treasury of a major source of revenue from church collections in France. Faced with such stiff opposition, Boniface uh, had backed down, explaining that he had not meant to cut off clerical contributions uh, for defense in times of dire need. Since the kings could decide what constituted, quote, defense and, quote, dire need, the victory for Edward and Philip was clear. So Boniface tried to do what they had been doing for quite some time to uh, excommunicate everybody that didn't do what they wanted to do, wanted them to do. But these rulers weren't worried about the excommunication of the Pope. They said they're gonna, they stood them down and we're going to just strip the uh, lands away from these clerics if they did not pay their tax. Um, <clears throat> in 1301, Philip imprisoned a French bishop for treason. And Boniface VIII again, VIII again threatened excommunication for taxation. So whereas he withdrew this taxation, uh, Boniface VIII, when he was uh, faced with the, the Edward I and Philip just shutting him down, he comes back with this after Philip imprisons a bishop. But Philip doesn't listen, and so as is their habit, if, if one strong overreach isn't enough, then they overreach even further. And so um, Boniface VIII ends up putting out something called the Unum Sanctum. The Unum Sanctum is probably the, the worst overreach ever of the Roman Catholic Church, where it display, explains clearly that it is altogether necessary for every human being to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So uh, Boniface VIII pronounces himself king of the world and that every person must listen to him in every possible way because he has all authority on earth. Shocking. But <clears throat> this is the place where we've come. So uh, Philip would not have anything to do with this, and so Philip counterattacks with a lawyer. He hires him a, a conniving and a powerful lawyer, a man named William of Nugaret, and William of Nogaret takes it to Boniface VIII and tries to unseat him. Nogaret was a master of the trumped-up charge. He had been known to approve of the use of, a, quote, voluntary testimony obtained by such a device as stripping a witness, smearing him with honey, and hanging him over a beehive. His case against Boniface included not only the illegitimacy of his election, but heresy, simony. If you remember that, simony is the purchasing of... Uh, church offices, people just straight up buying a bishop's office, paying the Pope for it, and getting that office. It's just another way of the church to create revenue. And immorality. Armed with authority from an assembly of French churchmen and nobles, he rushed to Italy, determined to bring the Pope to France for trial for a special church council. Boniface, now 86, had left the heat of Rome to summer in the foothills of the Apennine Mountains at his birthplace in Agony, uh, en Engony, excuse me. Nagaret and some troops he had marshaled broke in on the aged Boniface in his bedroom. Whether they actually manhandled him is in dispute, but certainly they helped abuse him. They kept him prisoner for several days, and when the plain people of Angony realized what was happening, they rose up and rescued Boniface. Num numbed and humiliated, the aged pope died within weeks. Commentary said he crept like a fox, reigned like a lion, and died like a dog. So this is Boniface VIII and his overreach of the Unum Sanctum. Let's see. Uh, people did not know what to do in this situation. So what you have here is that the pope has overreached so far that he has lost all of his authority. So secular rulers know that the papal position is corrupt and dishonored, and they're no longer listening to him. But the Pope has been such a fixture in Roman Catholic Christianity for so many centuries. you, you got to remember, people living could not, there was no memory of any generation past of there being Christianity without the Pope. So if people didn't know the scriptures, 
they didn't even know that it was possible to have Christianity without the Pope. That's just the way that they had always been raised, the way their parents were raised, the way their grandparents were raised, the way their great-great-grandparents, and generations before that. And so without a Reformation, as we're going to talk about next week, uh, people don't even realize that you can have Christianity without the Pope. This is what they've always been told. But it had been completely normalized. But people began to ask serious questions because with the abuse and the immorality and the simony and all this, people both outside the church and inside the church began to ask dramatic questions saying, this can't possibly be the way of Christ, or maybe we just need to get rid of Christianity altogether because the level of corruption here is completely out of hand. So in 1305, Boniface died, as was stated earlier, and the College of Cardinals elected a French pope next, Clement V. When Clement V came to power, Clement's election marked the start of the 72-year period in church history called, after the long exile of the ancient Jews in Babylon, the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Following Clement, six successive popes, all of French origin, chose to reside in a little town called Avignon uh, rather than in Rome. Avignon was located on the Rhone River, just across from the borders of Philip's domain. Under the popes, the town grew to a busy city of 80,000 with its immense clerical bureaucracy and the sumptuous papal palace. So once Philip is able to stand down the Pope, then he begins to control him as a pawn by getting the, the, uh, the cardinal, the College of Cardinals, to elect a French Pope, and then he moves the Pope to France to unseat power from Italy, and the Germans couldn't stand this. It was highly contested by them because all the, pa the papal wealth, influence, and authority is now seated in France. So for six, six terms, for 72 years, the Pope is in France. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. And this carries on into further chaos in the papacy. Because once this happens, it changes everything and eventually leads to bankruptcy in the Vatican. And so there is constantly, they're wanting to raise more and more money. When they were in Rome, they were wanting to build bigger cathedrals, uh, and make, renovate those cathedrals, make them even nicer. And once they're in uh, France, their, their revenue falls off and they need to raise more money because they have reached a point of bankruptcy to keep up their uh, incredible lifestyles of luxury. Well, the first thing they do is create something called the Anat. And Anat is whenever a bishop was appointed, his first year's income would be confiscated by the Pope. And so what they started doing is moving bishops around so that they had more, quote, first years wherever they were so the Pope could annex more and more of these bishops' salaries. Now remember, with simony, where a rich person wants to buy a bishop position so that he can get the lands and the authority that go along with that, that that person's first year salary is going to the Pope under this situation. Next, and even more lucrative, is what we've already talked about many times and won't repeat, is the practice of indulgences, people simply paying money and being told that their sins are forgiven because they paid for their sins to be forgiven. And then third, uh, just the straight up weaponizing of the Roman Catholic religion, as we've already talked about as well, being that a tax would be imposed, and if the people didn't pay the tax, then they would excommunicate them and threaten them with hell. And so all of this just outrageous. The idea of any of these things happening in our day and age is just hard to even imagine. But uh, this was a regular course back then, and people were, it had become so normalized that people were still willing to put up with it, but not much longer. Well, in 13, 13, 1377, the aged Pope Gregory XI re-entered Rome, comes back from France, and the joy over the reestablishment of the papacy in the Eternal City was short-lived. Gregory's death within a year required a new papal election, and the College of Cardinals, still heavily weighted with Frenchmen, yielded to the clamor of a Roman mob and chose an Italian for the Pope again. On April the 18th, Easter Sunday, the new Pope, Urban VI, was crowned. 
All the cardinals were present. In the summer months, however, along with Urban's dictatorial ways, brought second thoughts about his selection. In August, the cardinals suddenly informed all of Europe that the Pope of Rome had forced the election, uh, I'm sorry, the people of Rome had forced the election of an apostate to the chair of Peter, and the proceedings were invalid. A month later, the, quote, apostate responded by creating practically a new college of cardinals. So Urban VI refused to be tossed out. Instead, he created his own college of cardinals to affirm him. From their part, the French cardinals chose their own num from their own number another pope, Clement VII. So just to recap, Urban VI gets thrown out by the College of Cardinals. He claims he's still pope. He creates his own College of Cardinals, but the original College of Cardinals elects another pope, Clement VII, and announced this fact to the various civil and church authorities. And Clement VII moved about Italy and eventually sailed for France and Avignon. So we now have two popes. We have a two-headed monster here. This is a church split. Uh, church splits are not new to the world, and this church split, like so many other church splits, has nothing to do with the doctrine, nothing to do with the love of God, and instead everything to do with control and power and money. And so um, 39 years you have this situation where you have a perpetual two-pope situation. The church divided against itself, east and west, uh, and in, after 39 years, in 1409, you end up with uh, people, a complete outcry, saying, this, this can't be this way. We're not going to have this anymore. And so in 1409, a general council is called in Pisa on the west coast of Italy. And there, uh, they disposed, deposed, excuse me, both claimants to the papal chair and elected a third man, Alexander V. Neither of the two deposed popes, however, would accept the action of the council. So the church now had not two, but three popes. I don't think a lot of people realize this, that at one point this was the degree, the chaos in the Roman Catholic Church. Three popes at a time are too many by almost anyone's standards, especially so when one of the popes preaches a crusade against the other and starts selling indulgences to pay for it. So the three popes begin declaring crusades on each other, trying to raise up people to go kill the other pope and selling indulgences in order to pay for these things. This is beyond anything that even remotely resembles biblical Christianity and has turned into a complete earthly power struggle um, that is beyond compare. So three popes, how do they end this situation? So in 1414, there is another council. And the council here is the Council of Constance. And the Council of Constance is one that is made up of national representation. So the chaos had gotten to the point where a general council was put together in Germany, and each nation that had Roman Catholic churches sent a certain number of representatives so that e each of these nations had a say at the table. And they got one pope to step down, and they deposed the other two popes, and then eventually chose a fourth, but he was the only remaining pope. So they went from three back to one. But what happened here is that this pope, this fourth pope, was installed by this council. But his, uh, his name was Martin. And Martin had good reason to deny the work of the council, for it raised a very important question. Who had more authority, the council or the, or the pope? So if the council put the pope in his place, then technically the council has more power than the pope, but the pope is supposed to be in charge of everything. And so what happened was as soon as Martin came to power as the pope, he disposed the council and repudiated it and said that it had no authority, so that he again retained for himself all authority over all men. Well, who is greater? Well, they eventually... Uh, changed him out for Alexander the Sixth, who was the last one in our chapter. Alexander the Sixth was an astonishingly corrupt pope. 
who sired many children, a man who is supposed to be living a celibate life, has children running around all over the place, uh, and is greedy and ends up hoarding money and trying to create um, a hereditary line for himself through these illegitimate children, it's unbelievable. Um, at, the, at the lowest possible place for the Roman Catholic Church. So we, we it reached the end of this chapter, and I, I'm just so glad we're here because, to be honest, I, I'm just tired of talking about all this stuff. It, it's just depressing. When you look at where we are supposed to be as biblical Christianity, it, it is just disheartening that the church ever reached this place. But it's sad that we have to go so far away sometimes before we make a turn back to the way that we should be. And so the question would be, the question I posed originally to you, what happened? How do we ever get here to where we have a person who claims all authority over the earth as if they are the Lord themselves, you know, using uh, torture and crusades and paying for the forgiveness of sins and all manner of immorality? And uh, How do we get here? Well, the most basic answer to this is that the church long ago, long before this chapter, had lost sight of both the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. The authority meaning that I, I will do whatever the Scriptures tell me to do. Like, they are my authority in life. And if I, if I come to a hard place, I will submit to the Scriptures. And it also brings us to the place of of rejecting the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture means that all that we need to know for living a godly life is given to us in Scripture, and that we do not need to and must not, as we are warned in the last chapter of Revelation, add to the Scripture. So this, it, this constant habit of people, just like we saw in the Pharisees and just like we see in the Roman Catholic Church and canon law, of constantly adding and adding and adding the, the, the works and the traditions of man to the Word of God until the Word of God is so encrusted over that it's lost and becomes irrelevant to the keeping of the traditions of men. And of course, men then change those traditions and adapt those laws to whatever helps them or profits them or allows them to do whatever they want to do. And these conflicts Conflicting councils and conflicting laws bring confusion amongst the people, and all of it leads us to the situation that we eventually get to in the 14th century. But a question, another question I think is important at the end of this chapter for me, one that just comes right up to the top of my mind is, why would anyone continue to submit to papal authority in the Roman Catholic Church? And I ask that question today. I don't understand how people can be Roman Catholics in our day. I wonder how many Roman Catholics actually understand what happened here. I know a lot of people, and I think it's important, another reason why it's important to know church history is that many times people will try to throw this mess onto biblical Christians in our day and age and see, look at all, this, all these terrible things that you Christians did. And it's very important for Christians to say, listen, that is not my heritage. I am not a Roman Catholic. This was, this was not the heritage of the, the Church of Jesus Christ. This is the Roman Catholic Church. This was something that departed long ago from biblical Christianity and is the religion of man. I don't understand how people can continue to submit to the corrupt and conflicting authorities of the Roman Catholic Church from the past or the present. Because what is the present? You say, well, this is so terrible in the past. Well, surely they've, they've, they've changed their act in this day and age. That's not the case. The Roman Catholic Church in our modern day and age, in some ways, is even worse. The Roman Catholic Church in our modern day and age is the largest perpetrator of child sex abuse in the world. There is no other organization that houses more or protects and defends more child sex abusers than the Roman Catholic Church. It's a well-documented phenomenon that has gone on for decades now. And the church does not try to protect the children. The, the church shelters the corrupt priests, moves them around, pays millions of dollars of hush money, and hopes that nobody will ever find out. Uh, of course, it seems like every six months there's another whole slew of these uh, despicable priests found out, but somehow people keep going to the Roman Catholic Church. 
uh, you know, you, you wonder why. How does this happen? And the only thing I can I can understand, and this goes back to maybe you picked up on it a few lessons ago with my not um, being excited about the building of great cathedral buildings. I know many people enjoy, and I enjoy historically going and visiting those things in Europe, but I think that that is a big reason why people still go to the Roman Catholic Church. Going into those big buildings and seeing people in robes and incense being burnt and candles in Latin, and it just seems like there's got to be something otherworldly going on in this place because of all this stuff. And it is a form of religion that is empty. It's a form of religion that is counter to what the Bible preaches and teaches. The Bible does not teach a series of seven sacraments and that you must do these works in order to be saved. The Bible does not preach that we confess our sins to a priest. The Bible does not teach that our forgiveness comes from the church, but that it comes by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our only mediator. The Bible does not teach that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. None of these things are taught in the Bible, and they greatly lead people astray and ultimately uh, will lead to the downfall, the spiritual downfall and damnation of people as they believe a false gospel taught by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I understand that there are many Christians in the Roman Catholic Church, people that truly and earnestly believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. I understand that, but I would also argue that those people are not good Catholics. Uh, most of the people that I know that fall into that category remain in the Roman Catholic Church because of family ties. They feel like they have to stay there or they're going to lose their family. And my urging to people like that is that all throughout history, people have been willing to step away from false teaching, even at the sake of possibly losing ties with family members in order to follow after Jesus Christ. And it should be no different with the Roman Catholic Church. I know this is a hard mouthful, but I hope that the many preceding weeks in talking about all these things and just the disgust that it builds up in your heart will help you understand why I'm so passionate about these things and why the reformers that we'll begin to thankfully talk about next week, John Huss and John Wycliffe will be our first two, why these men and women were willing to go even unto death in order to strip these things away and reform Christianity back to the Bible, sola scriptura. We're going to go back to the scriptures and we're going to let it be our authority and our sufficiency and all the rest of these things cast to the side. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. That's chapter 22. Uh, next week we'll pick up uh, with the Reformation. I hope you have a good evening. Uh, if you'd like to join me, I will be on uh, Jitsi tonight at Redeemer Church History. That'll be the call name, Redeemer Church History. Have a great night.